Hey folks, uh, welcome back to my household classroom here to do uh, Bennett's Chemistry 12 tutorials. Uh, what are we on to today? So we're on to, we've been doing titration, so um, talking a lot about the quantitative, sorry, the qualitative side of titration so far. So um, kind of what is it, what's the equipment, how do you use the equipment, just kind of in, in a general sense. Uh, what is, uh, what's the indicator, what does equivalence mean, um, how does uh, the transition point of an indicator um, give you some sense of uh, whether an indicator will be useful for a strong strong or a strong weak titration. Uh, we've also gone into the uh, pH at equivalence point, which is kind of some of the theory behind uh, why different mixtures for a titration will give you a uh, pH at an equivalence point that may not be a pH of 7. Um, strong strong was always 7 but if you have a strong base with a weak acid titration that ends up giving you a pH at equivalence which is greater than 7 and so you need an indicator to do that. When you had a strong acid with a weak base uh, that mixture would give you an equivalence pH below 7 so you need an acid range indicator for that. So we've gone through that in the last two episodes. Now we're going to start a little bit more into the quantitative. So, okay, we've got the, the basics on the, on the how do you do this, what is it, how do you do it. Now, if you actually do it, how do you do the calculations that are associated with it. So today's going to be kind of the, the basic calculation day. The most um, useful calculation that's going to come out of titration will be determining the concentration of, an, of a solute. Okay, Now oftentimes the solute is not a purely unknown solute. You know what it is, uh, you just don't know what its concentration is. And that's going to be uh, a lot of the, um, the titration work that you end up doing in the lab will be of that nature, where you know what it is, you just don't know its concentration. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to do a couple of examples of those types of titrations today, okay? And then we'll do the math that is associated with them. So uh, the title is, is using titration to determine the unknown concentration, okay, of something. So let's go through a couple of examples. It's the easiest way to just to, to learn how to do this is just to kind of jump in and do a couple of examples. So my first example is going to be... And I haven't actually written the question up here, but I'm going to, in this scenario, I've got a weak monoprotic acid. So I haven't named what it is. So I, at this, in, for this scenario, I don't know the actual identity of the acid, but I know that it's A, it's a weak acid, so it's not a strong acid. I know it's monoprotic. So I know that the generalized formula for that thing would be, HX, or I could write HA, or whatever kind of generic way that you would write a monoproduct 1H acid. Okay, so I know that I know that much about it. So because it's an acid that I want to determine what the concentration is, what I would do is I would titrate using a strong base. And so the very typical strong base that we have out there uh, in our chemistry lab is typically sodium hydroxide. So what I've done is I've prepared the burette to deliver sodium hydroxide. Now, a, a whole bunch of things here. Let me talk about the, the actual practical side of this titration. So let's say you're in a class, you're in a lab, and this is exactly what you've been asked to do. Determine the concentration of this weak monoprotic acid that's in this solution. Okay, so what do you do? So you know it's an acid, so you know you're going to titrate using a strong base. Well, the base that I put into here. I need to know the concentration. It's, titration is useless if you're using a solution where you don't know the concentration to titrate with. You've got to know that concentration. So I use a standardized solution of the sodium hydroxide. Now what is a standardized solution? A standardized solution is one where you know the concentration. It's of known concentration. The purest way of knowing that you know something's concentration is to make the solution yourself from scratch. You add a certain mass of pure compound into a into distilled water to make up a very specific 
volume of solution. And you do that using a, a volumetric flask, typically what you do. You, you, dump, you measure the right amount of crystals that you want to make, you put them into the volumetric flask, you add some distilled water, you fully dissolve it, and then you add, you continue adding distilled water until it's up to the single mark of the volumetric flask. And then you've got a solution of known concentration, whatever you decided to make. Now, sodium hydroxide is kind of an unusual compound in that in its solid form, as soon as it comes in contact with the air, which has moisture in it, um, it will start to absorb the moisture from the air. And so you can actually put solid sodium hydroxide on a scale and just kind of leave it there for a few minutes. And if you watch it closely, two things will you'll notice right off the bat. Number one, the mass is going up on the scale. Like it'll just sit there and magically the sodium hydroxide will just be sitting there on the scale. You're not touching it or anything and its mass is going up. That's because it's absorbing water from the air. And so it's, it's going up in mass because it's got water attached to it. The second thing you're going to notice is it's going to start to glisten. It actually, it absorbs so much water that it actually, the surface of the little sodium hydroxide pellet will actually start to develop or sorry, dissolve in that little bit of moisture it starts um, to absorb which is it's highly unusual kind of weird thing. It's a concept known as the, the descriptor that you use, the adjective that you use, is that sodium hydroxide is hygroscopic. It absorbs water out of the air, and a lot of compounds will actually do Drying agents will tend to do that. They'll, they're hygroscopic. They absorb water out of the air. Because sodium hydroxide is hygroscopic, you cannot make a standard solution using solid sodium hydroxide. So actually coming up with a solution of 0.122 molar is a little bit tricky. You actually have to make a solution of sodium hydroxide as close as you possibly can, but then you have to make a standard solution of an acid that is non-hygroscopic, and then you have to titrate using the sodium hydroxide in the standard acid solution you made to determine the value for the sodium hydroxide. So there's, it's kind of interesting, but you use sodium hydroxide all the time but you have to standardize it first using a standard uh, acid solution. So it's kind of an interesting thing. You'll see this in your high school labs or in whatever labs you're going to do. The first step is always to make a standard acid solution that you standardize your sodium hydroxide with. Okay, now that's a lot being said. So when I'm pre preparing my burette, I wash it off and then I, I rinse the burette with just a little bit, 10, 15 mils of my sodium hydroxide. I pour that out, it's garbage. Um, and I just throw it down the sink or you neutralize it before you do that or whatever you're going to do to it. It's waste. So we get rid of it. And then we add our sodium hydroxide. And then we, if you remember from the very first titration video, you fill the tip so that's not, there's no air pockets in there at all. And then what you're going to do is you're going to measure the initial volume reading. Burettes never tell you how much is in there. Like you can't fill up a burette and say, well, I've just added this amount of volume in there. That's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to tell you how much you poured out the bottom. So you need an initial reading and a final reading and that's all you have. Okay. And then the difference is the volume that you poured out the bottom. So I need an initial reading. So what you'll do is you will typically in a titration, you'll have your data table kind of sitting there up at the ready for the trials that you're going to do. And so uh, my very first trial that I'm going to do, I filled this up, I prepared it by rinsing it with sodium hydroxide, then I've refilled, filled the tip, and now I'm ready to go. And then I read it, so I get there at eye level, and I remember that it's uh, certain, the burette is certain to every tenth of a milliliter, so you have to read the uncertain digit. So it'll always go to two decimal places. And so for my example here, I'm going to pretend that the initial burette reading, I should have put trial number over here, uh, 7.62 milliliters. So let's pretend that's trial number one. Okay, so I'm all ready to go with my burette. Then I've got to get my sample down there in the Erlenmeyer flask. So I take a sample of my unknown weak monoprotic acid. So I would have taken some of the solution and I would have poured it into a, into a clean and dry beaker because concentration is vital here, so I can't alter the concentration of the acid as I'm transferring it from one place to the other. So I take a sample of my acid in a clean, dry beaker, and typically what you're going to do is you're going to take, 
or because you're doing concentration, you must have a very uh, precise and accurate volume measurement of your sample. So more often than not, the most accurate sample um, uh, piece of equipment, sorry, that you would take a sample using would be a pipette, a volumetric pipette, which volumetric pipettes have one volume reading, and that one volume reading will be 5 mils, 10 mils, uh, 25 mils, whatever it's going to be. And so uh, for something like a titration, a pretty standard size pipette would be a 10 milliliter pipette. And so your pipetting skill, and again, this is just me and at my home trying to explain this, pipetting skills are something that you have to practice in a lab. Um, and so your pipette, it's that one where you put the bulb on the top and it's like a chemistry straw, basically, and you suction some solution up and you try and, and get the solution volume right on the little one increment that's in the volumetric pipette, and then you transfer it over to your Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, so you do that, and there's some technique to that, um, that if I had the stuff, I would show you, but it's a little challenging without the stuff here. So you take your 10 milliliter as an example. So I've said I've taken a 10.00 milliliter sample of weak monoprotic acid, and I transferred it using a 10 milliliter pipette, or whatever volumetric equipment you want to take. Your teacher might get you to use a graduated cylinder if you don't have pipettes. Graduated cylinders aren't quite as precise, but they'll do the job for learning how to do a titration. So I'm just going to write in here. The sample is 10 milliliters. That's a kind of a that's a key number to have just kind of off on the side. You'll remember when you're actually doing titrations. But now I need an indicator. Before you actually do your titration, you need an indicator. So let's think back to um, when we were talking about indicator choice, okay, and how do you know which indicator to be using? So you've got a strong base up here, okay, I'm going to say this is a strong base with a weak acid, strong base, weak acid, so when you do that combination, you are expecting a pH at equivalence above 7, because the products of this reaction, this neutralization reaction, will give you the conjugate base of whatever HX is. And so you're expecting the pH at equivalence to be above 7. Because of that, you're probably going to, not probably, you are choosing a base range indicator. The typical base range indicator, the one that every chemist, high school chemistry lab in the world has, and if not every lab in the world has, is phenolphthalein. And that's the pink one that goes from colorless to pink somewhere in the range of 8.2 to 10 and you'll your eyes typically start picking it up probably around 9 okay so you'll put a couple drops of phenolphthalein into here and because it's a weak acid phenolphthalein in its acid form is colorless and so you won't see anything right it's not going to have any color yet but you drip it in there okay and then what you start doing is you start doing the titration Right? You're ready to go. So you put your hand on the little valve there and you start opening it up and you start pouring in the base. And what you'll see, typically, just so in case you haven't ever done one or um, just to kind of give you a sense of, of this, is you'll pour it in and as the base pours in, right where it splashes into the acid, oftentimes you'll see a little splash of pink because the phenolphthalein, right where you drop in the base, well, the base hasn't quite reacted with the acid yet, and so it's super basic in that one little spot where the base is hitting down into the sample. It quickly, as you're swirling around and mixing it, it quickly dissipates because the base then gets mixed in with all the acid and it does the neutralization reaction. But what will happen is that pink splash will um, start to linger a little bit more. You'll get a sense that it's lingering there as you get closer and closer and closer to what your equivalence point is supposed to be. And once you kind of get that sense, ooh, it's, it's not really going away here super quickly. It started out, it was basically going away on its own. But then you had to wait like a second before it actually, you had to swirl it around before it actually started to disappear. Well, that's when you need to start tailoring the valves so that it starts going drop by drop. And not only that, but it should probably be drop, close it, swirl it around, drop, close it, swirl it around. And you're trying to get the drop. 
you might even get to the point. And check out this little tip from the tour on the technique. You might even get to the point where you turn the nose or you turn the valve so that just a little half a drop is hanging, hasn't fallen yet, it's hanging outside of the burette. It's like hanging off the little tip there. It hasn't gone anywhere yet. So what you do is you take a little distilled water bottle and you wash that little bit down into the Erlenmeyer flask. And so you've successfully added like a half drop or a third drop or a quarter drop or whatever it's going to be. Now you might say, hey, wait a minute, you can't add extra water into there, you're going to change the concentration. You're, yes, you are, but you already took the 10 mil sample. The moles that were in the 10 mil sample haven't changed at all. The whatever acid I put into there in the 10 mils is going to be there regardless of how much water I add at this point, right? So you'll just refer back to, well, I've got this many moles in my original 10 mil sample, and that will be my concentration. So I can add at this point as much distilled water as I want. It doesn't actually change anything. The moles of the acid are going to be the moles of the acid. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's a kind of a useful little thing. So you're trying to get that little half drop that makes the pink actually stay. So you're trying to get a transition color that stays. It doesn't disappear because what will happen is you'll put a drop in, it'll look pink, you'll swirl it, and a second later it'll disappear as the base actually mixes and finds those last few uh, acid molecules floating around in there. But at some point, you're going to add a little quarter drop where it starts mixing around and there aren't any more acid molecules to find anymore, which means the base is going to still be lingering in there unreacted. Well, that's when the little bit of pink is going to show. And once that pink stays, okay, then that means you've hit your end point. Now it's an end point because you've seen a color change, so you're not, it hasn't necessarily hit the exact theoretical equivalence point, but the end point is you visually saying, okay, I must be at the pH that is going to be pretty close to my equivalence point, so I'm going to stop right here. Okay, now be careful because if you sit there and you're swirling around trying to get that last little bit of pink to disappear, as you're swirling around, you're mixing carbon dioxide from the air. And when you mix extra carbon dioxide from the air, you're acidifying your solution. And so you're messing up your results because you can uh, create a false reaction between the carbonic acid you make by mixing carbon dioxide in there with some of the extra sodium hydroxide that was lingering, okay, when you weren't supposed to be doing that. You, so the kind of rule of thumb that I use with my students is, if it swirls and it disappears in one or two seconds, no problem. But if it actually stays for more than two seconds, you need to stop swirling and you're done. Okay, and so if it's a persistent pink and you can kind of sit the Erlenmeyer on the flask after two seconds of swirling, sit it on the, on the countertop or on a piece of paper or whatever, if it's a persistent pink, then you stop, okay? Over time, carbon dioxide will dissolve in there and react with sodium hydroxide. So you can't, after two seconds, you can't really say, well, you know, a minute later, it, the pink disappeared. Oh, I wasn't done yet. Yes, you were. Okay, it's the carbon dioxide. So you go and you go and you go until that point. Let's pretend at that point you're done and obviously this level will have dropped down to some point and you go, okay, well, I've reached equivalence. What's my final burette reading? So my final burette reading for this one, let's say is 21.40. Okay, there's trial number one. Now, typically what you're gonna do, and this will, the this will be different depending on, on what teacher you have, what lab you're in, uh, how much solution you have. Um, your teacher might say, we'll only do one trial because I don't want to waste all the chemical. Uh, chemical is expensive. It doesn't grow on trees for free. It's not like you go you know, like grab it out of the ground or something like that. So it's expensive stuff. So you don't just waste the stuff. Um, and But some teachers will say, no, you have to have three good trials. I know that for my experiments that I do with titration, 
when I do the standardization, I make sure there's three good trials. I then say typically for a regular titration, I say two good trials. And if we're very limited on how much stuff we have, or I know it's going to take you a really long time to do, I say just do one trial. Now, why would you do more than one trial? And the reason why you do more than one trial, it's obviously a scientific principle, is that you're trying to have as many trials to prove that you're, um, that there is a small amount of error, let's say. Okay, now it is highly unlikely you're going to do two trials where the volume is exactly the same because there's tons of points where there's going to be just random error, which means like the error in the actual equipment. Okay, so the pipette is 10.00 mil, mils plus or minus 0 0.01 of a mil. The burette is plus or minus 0 0.0, I think they're two mils. Um, you're going to have um, systematic error in that your observation of when the pink occurred might be slightly different. So there's a bunch of places where there's error going to be involved in this. So your trials, it's unlikely you're going to get two trials that are the exact same volume. You might, you might, more likely than not, you're not going to get two in a row. So a good, good trial is going to be defined by what your teachers say. I mean, there's actually rules and statistics for, for outliers. We're really not in chemistry 12 getting into the, the statistical significance and how do you determine the outliers and all that kind of stuff. A rule of thumb that I like to use with my chemistry 12s is I will say, if any value is outside of plus or minus one percent of the average then you're going to throw it out it is not a good trial and so if the second trial that i do okay so if i do a second trial here and it gives me a really wonky number like it's like one of them is let's say one of them is 20 milliliters and then the next trial is 23 milliliters okay well ooh. 20 and 23, the average is 21 and a half. 1% 1 of that is 0.2. So you're supposed to be within plus or minus 0.2 milliliters of the average. Well, both of those trials are outside of 0.2 plus or minus mils of the average, which means both of them are bad right now. So I need to do a third trial. And let's say I do a third trial and it gives me 20.1 milliliters. Well, you're starting to get a sense that the the one that was 23 mils is the outlier okay again you could average those three and you could check to see which of those are within plus or minus now you should keep going until you've got that but i would say that the trial one and trial three i would keep throw out the second one because it's an anomaly something happened i don't who knows what happened there's a whole variety of different things that could happen but I would just throw it out and go with trial one and trial three. So you're going typically until you have two good trials, one to back up the other, essentially. Okay, so let's say I redo this. So now I've got to clean out my Erlenmeyer. Um, it doesn't need to be dry. It needs to be clean and then rinse with distilled water. And the reason why it doesn't need to be dry is because I'm pipetting into it a 10 mil sample of the acid. Again, if there's extra water in there, my 10 mil sample that I take in my pipette has a certain number of moles of the acid in it. So it doesn't matter if those moles then get diluted. The number of moles, which is what titration is going to give us, the number of moles remains the same, okay? As long as you have that measured volume and the concentration doesn't matter, okay? So let's, I set up and I maybe add some more base into there to fill it back up again. Um, and let's say I start my second trial and it starts at 3.90. And I take a 10 mil pipetted sample again and I start doing a second trial. I add my phenolphthalein in and I do a second trial. And what happens is after you start doing multiple trials and then multiple different titrations, your skills of pipetting and kind of setting up and going through and getting everything done, 
you start to get pretty good at it. Um, the lab that I that I get my Chem 12s to do that has literally seven parts to it, they end up doing somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 trials throughout the entire thing. And so, um, and that's if they don't mess up. I mean, sometimes they mess up and they end up doing five or six trials for one part of the lab. And so skill-wise, you can get really good if you do this a lot. And it goes fast. So we do this second trial. We go the exact same thing. I get down to the, the quarter drop and I rinse it in and oh, there's my persistent pink in there. I'm done my second trial. Let's pretend that one is 17. Whoops. I said 17 and wrote 18. 17.80 milliliters. Notice that I'm putting the 0, 0.0 on all of those values. That must mean that, for example, this one, 3.90, that means when I read it, the meniscus was smack on the 3.9 increment, but it had to be measured to the hundredth of a mil. So it's right smack on the 3.9. I added the zero to make the proper level of precision. Okay, now, now we're done. Okay, so, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. Maybe we don't have two trials that are exactly the same. So let's kind of over on the side, and I'll just kind of scribble it over there. You could have a third column of your, of your table if you wanted to. It could be volume of base added. So I do the actual subtraction. So I do the first one. So 21.40 minus 7.62 and that difference is how much base I added for trial number one. In trial number one you do that subtraction and it's 13.78 milliliters. So then I do the second calculation and so the second one is 17.8 minus 3.9 which gives me 13.90 uh, milliliters. Now they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close. Now are they close enough? So what you would do is you would take the average of them. And so the average, you add the two together and you divide by two. And the average of these two would be 13.84. So 13.84, 1% of 13.84 would be 0.13 or 0.14 if you round it off. So are these values within 0.14 of that average? And so they are. Okay? So 0.14 of the average is actually quite a small, narrow range. Okay? 1%, plus or minus 1% is actually quite precise. Your teacher may not um, require that level of precision. Um, so if uh, these are both, sorry, long story short here, these both are good titrations. Okay, so they're, sorry, they're good trials. I shouldn't say they're good titrations. They're, they might have had perfect technique and it went weird. They are good trials, so they're close enough together that I can now stop. I don't need a third trial, so I don't have a third row that I don't even need. And now I can proceed to the actual calculation part of it all. Okay, so then what do you do for the calculation part of it all? Well, the very first thing you've got to do is you've got to figure out what is the neutralization equation that I was doing. I need the stoichiometry of this reaction. So I took sodium hydroxide. Okay, so that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to write down a neutralization equation. So sodium hydroxide in aqueous form. Plus, now I don't know the actual acid, but I know it was a weak monoprotic. Monoprotic is more important than even the fact that it was weak. So I'm taking the generic HX. They react 100% because of the sodium hydroxide, and that's intentional. I'm trying to get it to go 100% uh, to form water, the H plus the OH to make water plus the sodium salt of whatever X was. So NaX. And then I would balance it, and this is already balanced. It's a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one relationship. So what the, the idea is is that the moles of 
there's going to be a stoichiometric relationship here. And so the moles of one reactant is going to be related to the moles of the other reactant in whatever mole ratio they are in. So since this is one to one, the moles of the sodium hydroxide will equal the moles of the acid. Okay, so I'm going to take this in kind of a multi-step approach, but I'm going to say, I'm going to write down first of all, because of this, the moles of sodium hydroxide will equal the moles of the HX because of the reaction that I wrote right up above it, one to one. The moles of the sodium hydroxide, well, it's I know it's concentration, it's 0 0.122 molar. Okay, so... 0 0.122 moles per liter times, and I need a volume, right? I need the volume of whatever base I had. So which volume do you take? Do you take the 13.78 or do you take the 13.90? And the answer is neither, um, because neither one is necessarily the correct answer. The correct answer is the average. Right? So if you did more and more and more and more and more and more trials, the average of all of the trials is probably pointing to the true volume of the base that it would have taken to neutralize 10 milliliters of that unknown weak acid. So, using my two good trials, I can, oh, I mean it's only a, an N of two, but I can say that the average is probably closer to the answer than either one of the 13.78 or 13.90. So the volume I'm going to use is going to be the 13.84, which is the average. Okay, so here the average volume equals 13.78 plus 13.90 divided by 2, which was 13.84 milliliters and that's the vol volume that I want to take. It's in milliliters so let's make sure we move the decimal and move decimal three places to the left and then we'll we'll take that milliliters and we'll put it into liters so that it cancels. So I have 0 0.01384 liters. So the moles of the sodium hydroxide equals concentration times the volume, right? Which is something you've probably known since uh, doing your mole calculations in chemistry 11. So I've got 0 0.122 times 0 0.01384 equals, and using proper sig figs, so I've got three and four, so I get three sig figs on my answer. I have equals uh, 1.69 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. And so there's my moles, and it's from the stoichiometry with the sodium hydroxide. So the concentration of the HX will be 1.69 times 10 to the negative 3 moles divided by now, which volume? Now, you got to be kind of careful because there's volumes all over the place, right? Like, you could take the base, you could take the acid, you could add them together. Like, what are we talking about? Are we talking about before? So you got to remember, this is the number of moles of acid that was in that original 10 milliliter sample you removed from the bottle or the wherever you took it from in the first place. And so you have to go back to what the sample volume was. Not the total volume, not the base volume, none of that volume. It's the sample volume, and the sample volume is 10 milliliters. So I write that in liters, because molarity is in moles per liter. And I get 0 0.169 molar. And so the concentration of the HX in that original sample was 0.169 molar. And we've answered the question. That's how it's done. Okay? So how careful you are with your um, with your titrating and actually getting to that equivalence point properly. Like making sure that this value right here is done in a very controlled fashion with skill. 
um, kind of plays out in what this number ends up being. Okay, so it's kind of critical that the technique allows you um, to get a good, accurate answer. Okay, so there's the first one. The second one I'm going to do is um, very similar. It's going to look very similar, but it's going to be um, different reactants. So I'm going to erase all the blue stuff. Get rid of this. Might as, well, might as well use my original um, data table there. Okay, so this titration, what we're going to do is we're going to take some standardized uh, 0.0980 molar hydrochloric acid. Okay, so we've made a solution where we know its concentration. Um, when it's HCl, typically what happens in a chem lab is we have, we receive bottles of concentrated stock solutions. Okay, so like we get a hydrochloric acid that is like literally, it's like in the neighborhood of a 30% um, HCl solution. So molarity wise, we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 16 molar. So we're talking like nasty stuff. You open that bottle, if you take a whiff of it in your nose, the vapors themselves start to burn your, your nasal membranes. It's really nasty stuff if you, you happen to have really concentrated HCl. So we have this really concentrated stuff and in a fume hood, obviously, we dilute that to whatever solutions we want, okay? So let's pretend we've taken our stock solution, we've diluted it so that it's 0.0980 molar HCl. Down here we're going to take a 10 mil sample of phosphate. Now it wouldn't just be phosphate, it would be say sodium phosphate or potassium phosphate. It would have its cation with it but it's going to be a spectator so we don't really, I don't really care. Okay. So I've eliminated it. So let's pretend we've taken, um, we've got this sample of PO4 negative 3. And we want to know the concentration of the PO4 negative 3. Well, what is PO4 negative 3? How could we, how could we use titration to, to figure out its concentration? Well, PO4 negative 3, having a negative charge and being the conjugate of a weak, sorry, conjugate of a weak acid, uh, it's going to act as a base. So down here, I have a weak base. Which means that I want to titrate using a strong acid, which sure enough, HCl is a strong acid. So I go through that whole process of setting up my burette for HCl and I get the I get the sample of PO4 in there using my pipette. Now I have to rethink what indicator I want, because phenolphthalein won't work on this, because where is my pH at equivalence going to be? Got a strong acid reacting with a weak base. The reactants are strong acid, weak base. They are going to make the conjugate acid of H3PO4. Well, they're going to make the conjugate acid of H3PO4. So at equivalence, we're going to have a solution of an acid. The pH should be below 7 at equivalence. And so I'm going to choose an acid range indicator. So my favorite one, one that is in a typical high school lab, is Brom Cressel Green. Um, and so I'm going to take some drops of Brom Cressel Green, and I'll put some Brom Cressel Green into my solution and it, I believe Brom Cressel Green starts blue and it has a blue base form and a yellow acid form. So it's going to start blue. And so the solution down here is going to look blue because it's basic. And I'm going to start adding my HCl. Now let's pretend um, you're pretty, pretty wise to this titration stuff. So you figure instead of doing math, you're going to add HCl in here until it's actually the meniscus is right on the 0.00. 0. 
So let's say you started your first trial knowing that you're going to be subtracting and what's easier to subtract than zero. So you do your first trial, you start it at zero. And so you start going and going and going and going and going and going. Um, and it takes quite a bit. Let's say it takes, uh, let's say it takes 31.98 milliliters. So there's your first trial. And of course you have to do a second trial to confirm the first trial. And so you refill, and you don't go to zero the second time. You go to, I don't know, you go, you get a little bit lazy. And uh, before I actually do that, let's let's go through one of the things, one of the mistakes people make. So they'll do their first trial, they'll go to 31.98. And they don't stop to think before they go on to the second trial. And they take do a second trial, and they get a their Erlenmeyer clean, and they... They rinse it out, they rinse it with distilled water, they put another 10 mils of, they pipette in some PO4 negative 3, they put it in there and they put in their indicator and they're ready to go. And they just start from where they left off. So 31.98. Now, the wise um, experimenter will notice that the first trial took about 32 milliliters. So we need at least 32 milliliters in the burette to actually do this. Well, if you're going to start your second trial at 31.98, but the burette only goes to 50. You've got an issue because you've only got another 18 milliliters before you run out of room down here at the bottom of the burette, and you're going to go past the increments. So how do you how do you solve that? Well, you make sure that you're thinking this before you do it, and you refill your burette before you do the second trial. But let's say you already started. You didn't really stop and think about it and so you started at 30 31.98 and you just started going and you just opened it up and dropped some stuff in and you were already part way through your titration and you went uh oh we don't have enough in the burette to actually finish this trial do we have to throw it out and the answer is no you don't have to throw it out you just stop wherever you you got to you record it because you know how much you've dropped out as long as you record it if this was 31.98 you realized it when you got to 43 and you wrote down 43.00, you know how much you've put in so far. Now you can refill and you can just continue because then you'll know how much you added in from that point on. Okay, so never panic. Always think you can always refill a burette as long as you have an initial and a final reading before you actually go back and refill it. Okay? But let's say you did catch that, and so you refilled it, and you started, I don't know, you started up here at uh, 10.60 milliliters. And you add, 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 and you go down to, uh, what would that end up being? 42.51. Uh, And so your second trial is that. Again, what we would do is we would we do some math and we make sure that our two trials are good trials. They're within plus or minus 0.1 or 1% of each other. So this one is obviously 31.98. Uh, that one's 32.98. Uh, uh, milliliters. Okay, so those are actually pretty darn close. Now look, 1% of the average, because we've added more volume, 1% of, of these guys is going to be closer in the neighborhood of plus or minus 0.32 milliliters-ish type of thing. So 1% um, is not always the same value. It's the larger the volume of stuff that you're adding in your trial, 1% of that is going to be a larger amount, so the range gets a little bit wider. Okay? So... Uh, now I'm going to average those two to get to get my actual volume. So I'm going to take the average volume equals 31.98 plus 31.91 divided by 2. The difference is 3.5, 31.95. Okay, now I rounded that up because the actual average is supposed to be 
uh, 31.945, but I rounded up to 31.95. Okay, so now, following the exact same steps that we did before, we can't do any calculations until we have a balanced neutralization equation. We need to know the stoichiometry. So we go and we say, what did we react? So we reacted HCl in aqueous form with PO4 negative 3. Now, HCl goes 100%, and it goes 100% with whatever base you put in there. So HCl, like a single HCl molecule, will put 1H onto a PO4 and make PO4 negative, or sorry, HPO4 negative 2. Well, that's still going to have a negative charge. And so you can put another H on it, and it becomes H2PO4 negative 1. It still has a negative charge. You put another H on it, and it becomes H3PO4 that's when it can't take more H's. So this is very critical. During titrations, they go to what's known as the final endpoint. They don't care that it has multiple stages. So the PO4 negative 3, as you're going to learn in a couple of classes here about titrations and titration graphs and things of that nature, the H's go on the PO4, yeah, they might go incrementally. It might go, the first one goes on, then the second one, then the third one. But the titration will not finish. Like, you won't actually get that rapid change in pH until you've gotten rid of all of your um, base, in this case, the PO4, negative 3, and all of the negative charge that that thing could have. Which means the product of this reaction will be when... PO4 negative 3, sorry, the equivalence point will be reached when the PO4 negative 3 has every one of its negative charges filled up with an H, which means it forms H3PO4. So it's a charge of negative 3, it has room for 3 H's, it will, the titration will continue until you get those 3 H's on it, and that's when your final endpoint will occur plus Cl minus. Now, this is obviously, I mean, you can tell right off the bat that this thing is not balanced, okay? So you now go through and you actually balance it. So because there's three H's on here, it took three HCl's over there. That means you make three chlorides over there, and there is your balanced equation. Now, um, the phosphate, might have had Na sodium ions attached to it. So this may have been, and maybe you would have had this equation, the HCl plus Na3PO4 goes to, and so I'd be writing a formula equation for this neutralization. And you would go through, it's almost like you'd be better off thinking like in grade 10, where um, you're going to make, they swap partners, right? So this NAs will go with the CLs, and you'll make NaCl, and then the H will go with the PO4, and because PO4 is negative 3 and H is plus 1, it makes H3PO4. And then you balance it. You'll see that you get the exact same thing in the formula, but now the sodiums are kind of in the mix and, and they're in there, okay? Which is probably a truer way that the solution's going to, to be. You can't pipette PO4 negative 3 by itself. You would pipette with it three sodium ions for every PO4 negative 3 that you had, okay? So either one of those equations, it doesn't really matter which one you use. They're the same. One's a formula equation, one's a little bit of a net ionic equation, okay? Although, even in a net ionic equation, the chloride probably would have been, or yeah, the Cl minus would have been eliminated. Okay, so we're going to use the stoichiometry here to actually figure this out. So now what you do is you know the moles of one thing. And you know the moles, in this case, of the HCl because you know its concentration and you know the volume of HCl that you added to it. So you know the concentration, you know the volume, you know the moles of that thing. So the known thing is the HCl. The unknown thing is the PO4, okay? So the moles of the HCl 
equal. Now you can't just write down moles of PO4 because they're not the same value. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. There is, a, there is a mole ratio that you have to apply. And so I oftentimes in my class, I come up with a little saying and um, to figure out the moles of what you want. So I call it the moles of what you want equals um, such and such, such and such. So the, in this case, the moles of what I want is the PO4 negative 3. That's what I want. The moles of what I want equals the coefficient of what I want over the coefficient of what I have. So what I want is the PO4. The PO4 coefficient is a 1. What I have is the moles of the HCl, because I know it's concentration volume, one third times the moles of what I have. So the moles of the PO4 are going to be one third of the moles of the HCl. And that you can kind of see that in the, the stoichiometry of the equation that it's a three to one ratio. So this one's going to be one third of the HCl. But I have that little saying. Uh, moles of what you want equals coefficient of what you want over coefficient of what you have times the moles of what you have. So if you kind of forget, should I be dividing by 3 or multiplying by 3, that little saying might actually help. Okay, then I plug in what I know, because I know the moles of the HCl, but I have to do concentration times volume. So that will be one-third times concentration, 0, 0.98 zero moles per liter times the volume in liters, obviously, 0 0.03195 liters. Okay, so my liters cancel. And this is going to come out in moles. So I do 0 0.098 times 0, 03195 uh, divided by 3. 1.0, I'm checking my sig figs here, so I've got 3 in the concentration, that's the limiting one. 0, 04 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Okay, so you have to make sure that you have a balanced neutralization equation to use the stoichiometry to figure out the moles of the unknown. So the concentration of the PO4 solution would then be the moles divided by the volume, which is pretty straightforward. Again, be careful. Right? Like, don't make a silly mistake by dividing by the uh, weird volume. Don't divide by that volume. Um, don't divide by the two of them combined. It's the volume of the sample. This is how many moles of PO4 you had in the sample you originally took with the pipette. So it's 10 milliliters. 10 mil sample. So that's going to be 0 0.104 molar PO4 negative 3. Okay? So... Titration is, it's very kind of typical to get the concentration of the unknown. Um, titration doesn't give you concentration directly. It gives you moles directly. Um, and so you do a titration between a solution where you know the concentration, you, you figure out what volume you add, because the burette's going to tell you. That gives you moles of that reactant. You use the stoichiometry to figure out the moles of the unknown. And then because you took a very specific volume of that unknown as a sample, you can then divide moles by volume and you end up with concentration of it. And it's a very typical thing that you're going to be doing with titration. So make sure you know the parts of what you're going to have. Uh, and hopefully that helps out with any of the concentration calculations you'll end up doing uh, with titration. Okay. Uh, Good luck. We'll see you next time. Um, sorry, I didn't write down what next class was going to be on. Next class, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can do with titration that aren't just plain old concentration. So um, there'll be a little extension. So I'm going to do one of them is going to be um, determine the Ka of an unknown weak acid. And the other one is going to be um, 
determine the percent composition of either a solution or a solid or something of that nature, percent composition of something, okay? And uh, we'll see you next class.